All right, we are good on all platforms. So um, good evening, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, I'm very super excited for tonight. Uh, here with Dr. Brad Olson, our title and discussion is gonna be about credentialing, credentialing 101 uh, with the AACD. Uh, we decided to pick my platform because Brad is so active on social media that we didn't wanna blow up the internet. <laughs> with his Facebook and Instagram followers. So we kind of toned it down with mine. I know, Brad, I mean, it's got to be an eight hour I'm excited. Day. This, new, this new stuff, this new Facebook thing, you know, that's out now. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really great. I think you heard about Facebook when I told you we were actually going live on it. I've heard you? of Facebook, but the Instagram thing just blew me away. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, this is a, a real special evening for me. Uh, Brad has been pivotal in my career in the AACD. I mean, he's a friend, uh, consider him family at this point. Uh, we spent some time together this summer at his uh, awesome house in uh, Beach House in Dewey Beach, Maryland. Uh, Dewey Beach, Delaware, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, um, I will uh, let Brad tell you a little bit about himself. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he mentored me through accreditation and fellowship. He's the current fellowship chairman. Uh, and I remember the actual exact moment that you and I met uh, was in Hawaii at AACD. I don't know if it was 07 or 08, one of those years. And I was just starting my accreditation process. As a matter of fact, I took the written exam there. And I was in your accreditation workshop. And who walks in and sits next to me? Hakchu Saverkul. And uh, we sat through your course, and that evening we were out by one of the fire pits in the hotel, and Hak Chu was there, and the company she had worked for that time from England, uh, you were there, and uh, turns out we both used Hak Chu as our technician, which we were completely blessed for many, many years, as I know you'll attest to in a oh, second. Sure. Um, and you looked at me and said, I saw you in my course today, you're going to do the accreditation. I said, yeah. And you said, do you have a mentor? And I said, no. You said, well, you do now. Here's my email. Uh, and we got rocking from there. So it's been uh, a pleasure to get to know you through the academy, but even uh, a bigger honor to get to know you as a person. I mean, you've been pivotal in my career, my training, my eye, uh, and I attribute a lot that I've accomplished in dentistry to uh, what you've taught me. So thank you. And maybe tell the folks out here. Uh, my praise. Thank yourself. you, Adama. Yeah. Thanks for the invite tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, um, it's uh, been a a pleasure to work with you and a pleasure to watch uh, how you've grown and where you've gone with the profession. And, you know, we, we'll get into mentorship here a little bit down the line and the value of it and the importance and, and um, uh, where that leads to. But uh, just briefly, I had practice in Waldorf, Maryland. If any of you were at the AACD meeting at, that was at the Gaylord in Washington, DC, you were about 25 minutes from my office when you were at that location. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a little bit of geography of where I am. So it's Southern Maryland. Um, and uh, been, again, 37 years in Southern Maryland. It's been very good to me. Um, you know, something we'll talk about here a little bit as well in accreditation is that back when I decided that I was going to transform my, transform my practice over into a more restorative cosmetic based type of practice, I was told by many that you can't do that in Southern Maryland. You, you can't do that down there. It doesn't work. Those people won't do that there. Um, so that'll be a valuable lesson that we'll talk about tonight in, in terms of accreditation is that's complete nonsense. Um, it's nonsense of where you practice. I don't care if it's big group, small group, solo, big office, small office, fancy office, basic office. I had a, I had a friend of mine come from dental school right after I got accredited. So someone come down to see your office. He walked in and he said, you got accredited in this office? <laughs> um, it, was in a, it was in a strip mall and had, the only windows were in the very front um one bathroom shared by patients staff doctor um so really just a teeny tiny little spot so it's really you know it's a testament to what you want to do and what you want to make of of, of the credential uh, more than it is uh, the, the show that you're putting on so anyhow got accredited in um around 99 got fellowed in 05 and um a pleasure to serve as accreditation chair for, for one stent, was on the ABCD for one stent, and now I've been fellowship chair for um, about seven years. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, you know, I think um, 
you know, one of the things uh, that I think we can touch upon, I mean, you know, a lot of people, and I get a lot of message on social media and people, they want to be accredited. They want to be accredited and they focus really on the end result, right? And even fellowship. I mean, the invaluableness of proper mentorship and the learning experience is really for me, what made it for me above and beyond anything else, you know, and the, yes, the Academy is, has the credential and the fellowship, which is amazing, but it has so much more to offer in education. And there are so many phenomenal dentists who just didn't really, maybe the credential wasn't for them or it wasn't their Absolutely. time. And, and, and I think that's a big thing. I think, you know, a lot of people just focus on, oh, I want that title or I want that letter, but there's so much that, more that goes into it. And I know we're going to get into that a lot because it was really important to me and I know you as well, but I, I think what people, you know, the, the people that follow me on social media or are on this, watching this now, you know, the Academy as a whole is just, in my opinion, one of the pivotal, pivotal things in, in my career. And I know you say the same. I've heard you say it. Um, yeah. And yes, the credential is amazing and we're going to talk about it and how we grew with it. But there's so much to this Academy uh, that I think is positive. And, and, and if people aren't members, you know, I mean, I always recommend that they do it because even if they decide credential might not be for them at this time or ever, there's so much they can get out of this Academy uh, and the people in it. And, and I, I just think it's been pivotal in, in my career at this point. Well, I, I agree, Adamo. And, and one of the things that I found early in the AACD was I would go to uh, different meetings, wherever they would be. And it was either very serious or it was very woe is me. Everybody griping and bitching about the profession and insurance and I got to wear gloves now and whatever, whatever over the, over the years you had to gripe about, they griped about. Then you go to the ACD, positive energy. People were jazzed about their profession. They were jazzed about the future. They were jazzed about learning. And it was just, I walked into that environment and I to tell my story is the first time I went to a meeting, um, I, I was poolside and Dennis Wells stood there and talked to me for 30 minutes. He didn't know me from a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. And he just gave me his time, his energy, his excitement about glad I was there and how much I was gonna enjoy it and how much I was gonna learn and how much he continued to learn. So. It's just always that positive energy. And you know, the other thing you were talking about is that you know, it's, it's not just their credential. The counter side to that is that everybody, that is the motivator though. Right, you of course. You want that piece of paper, you want that title, you want to stand on that stage. And so that is, so I don't poo poo that entirely just because it, it, it's a, it is a motivator. But, but we will guarantee anybody who goes through the process, they will look back and see it was the journey. Yeah. They'll look back and then when the dust settles and the celebration's over, they'll look back and they'll say, wow, how I was transformed made such a difference in my career. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. I remember my first ACD, so I'll even preface that with my local mentor, great friend, Dr. Gary Alex. I know you know, know. Gary very well, yeah. right? And uh, I was at a study club in my office. I was maybe a year into practice and uh, I showed a case and he walked up to me after and he said, you got good hands. You don't know shit. And I was like, wow, thanks. <laughs> he goes, I want you to go to the Dawson Academy and learn occlusion. Yeah. And I'm going to take you to the ACD. And he did. He took me to Atlanta. It was my first one. Yeah. And I remember looking at the poster boards at the accredited, newly accredited people saying, man, I hope I do dentistry that good, half that good yeah. that day. And Gary was speaking. So he had a speaker's lounge pass and he goes, you're going to eat lunch with me. So he's, now I probably was three out of the five Dawson complete. I go into the speaker's lounge. She sneaks me in. We sit down. Who sits next to him? Pete Dawson. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like, you know, a basketball fan walks into with his friend and they sit next to Michael Jordan, right? I'm like, wow. And Gary, I'll never forget it, says, Pete, I'm going to come see your lecture later. And Pete Dawson looked at him and said, why would you do that? You could teach it. And I'm like, yeah. excuse me? What, what's going on? Right? Yeah. So, and you're right. I mean, it was such a jazz everybody was just so positive and with the names that i was just recognizing being new there was not an ego in the place at right. all absolutely at all everybody just wanted to be around each other and share things and i mean i took from there i was hooked i yeah. couldn't wait to get rolling after that so 
uh, yeah, it was a cool first experience. You talk about egos too. Is all it takes, is all you have to do is walk into the, that room or walk into the speaker's lounge and you're quickly humbled by the crowd you're in. You know, yeah. you, think you think you're the shit. <laughs> and then you get in there and you look around and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm running with a fast crowd. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you said, uh, how did you tell us a little bit of how you got started in the academy? Yeah, so um, I will credit my, my dear friend, Brian Lesage. Um, Brian and I were classmates at the University of Maryland. We sat in the clinic uh, one chair apart from each other. And, um, you know, to have, to have the skill set of a Brian Lesage nearby as you're in your, you know, learning career, um, just on the other side of me, I have a dear friend, Gary O'Shea. So I had, I had some star, star dentists right near me that was great to just bounce off of and, and learn from. And so... Brian calls me one day and says, congratulate me. He says, what am I congratulating you for? I said, well, I just got accredited in the AACD. I said, that's great. Tell me what the AACD is and tell me what accredited is. <laughs> and so that was my introduction. And, and so here's the, here's the funny story that so many of us tell is that he said, well, here's what you do. You know, you join. So I joined right away. And then he says, and then accreditation, you have to present cases. And here are the cases. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I do that all the time. So back when I went through accreditation, you were assigned a mentor. Mentors weren't optional. You had to have a mentor. And we since changed that simply for a number of obstacles that that ran into. But I sent my very first case, packed up the slides, FedEx them. Yeah, uh-huh. FedEx the you're slides. Out, you're dating yourself, boss. <laughs> to, to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Bruce Stewart. Um, was my mentor. And um, so, so I send, I send my hot, hot case right out to Bruce just to, so I could get my pat on the back. And I get it returned the two and a half page letter that basically opens up by, well, this was a nice service for your patient. And then it goes on for the next single spaced two more pages to just tear it apart. And, and I mean tear it apart in a, in, in a constructive manner of educational. I was like, wow, okay. And so what I learned was every time I would send to Bruce, the letters got shorter. Mm -hmm. They got shorter because I was picking it up. I was starting to, and my eye was being trained. I was starting to see what this case type was about, what they were looking for. Um, I was choosing better cases. Um, so all of those progressed along through that mentorship and Bruce was Bruce was fabulous. I mean, he was, uh, he, he was great. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a road that, you know, many of us have taken because you walk in thinking oh, I got this and then you're quickly humbled. Yeah. I'm going to get to a very humbling story in a second, but so back when, when you presented, now you can submit a case type every one or two, you know, session. Did you have to do them all at once? Yes. Was it in person? Can you explain the process from when you did the process now is just so infinitely better. But, you know, like anything, you stand on the shoulders of the people who went before you, you know, and you, we look back at that old board of governors and the people who originally put this together. And it was just absolutely brilliant what they did um, in, in forming a, a criteria uh, list and in putting together an exam process. And so it, it, you just look back. But then, of course, refinement and growth happens through that. So when I went through the process, you showed up with your boxes of slides. You went into the room where you had five examiners looking at you, you loaded your slides up and you gave an oral presentation with each of your cases. You didn't know if these, these there's no pass or fail yet. This is the first time the examiners are seeing the cases and you're doing an oral presentation with the case. So intimidating, um, th that was an understatement. Yeah. Um, so you're presenting at the same time, they thank you, you leave the room and you get your results later down the line and see how you did. You didn't make it, you pack it up and you come again with five new ones or four, three of the same and two new ones. And you went back through that process again. So, so you, basically it, it was a combo of, you know, now we have the written exam is step yeah. one. Yeah. And there was the written written exam. Exam at that time. Right. So then you have, the, we have the five clinicals now. And once you pass the five clinicals, then you go to the oral. This was more of a combo of the five clinicals and the oral all at once, but none of it anonymous. So now we're anonymous with the, with the five clinicals. The oral exam obviously is not, but so you basically had a combo in person right in front of you. And you know, you hit on the key word anonymous. I mean, that's the beauty of our process right now sure. is, you know, obviously, I mean, it's human nature that if the guy who walks into your room 
is, you know, Frank Spear, um, you know, you, you're, kind of, you're kind of biased. Not, not, not that Frank ever did it. I'm just using that as a name. You know, if John Coyce walked in, if, if, if Pete Dawson walked in, you know, so if, if you know, if the giants of the industry walked in and said, I'm about to show you my cases, that, that would change the dynamic a little bit of what you're sure. looking at. Sure. As we're now, it doesn't matter, you know, who you are, where you come from. Um, you can be a, you can be a big shot lecturer that everybody knows, or you could be in a small town and nobody's ever heard of you. Yeah. So when I went through it, nobody, no, no, nobody ever heard of me. So yeah, it, anonymous is really the, you know, so you, and what you said also is you don't have to pack five at one time. Sure. Take them as they come, you know, don't rush them along, give them time. Let the, let the tissue mature, you know, let, let the case selection be just where you want it to be. Take time to refine your case. You're not under the gun to say, I've got to have these five by this date and have them together all of them. Yeah. And I see that a lot with people, you know, that I mentor now from even through social media with the accreditation processes. And I get it because it's so exciting and you want to do it, but they want it way too fast. They, 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 they really need to take a, a little bit of a step back and start to understand that. And, and if they do the mentorship process right, the way I was mentored, and I'm going to tell a funny story to, to reiterate your first two page letter. Um, I mean, the, the education you get out of it is amazing, but it's patience. It's not a, that's why we give you five years for five cases. It sounds like an eternity, but you know, a case type three where you're replacing a tooth and you're doing an implant, you might take two years. You might need soft tissue graft to make it ideal because I mean, you see some of these cases that come through, they're gorgeous. I mean, you wouldn't even know that, yeah. that, that anything ever happened, right? Um, but yeah, I remember, um, my first case that I ever submitted to you for mentorship, it was on my hygienist, it was eight and nine, and she had the weirdest shade map on, her, on eight and nine. Hakchu and I went back and forth about four or five times, and then I nailed it. I nailed the color, it was money. And I remember sending it to you, it was like nine o'clock at night, I wake up in the morning, I'm at the local deli up the road getting a turkey egg white wrap, and I see email Brad Olson, I'm like, <laughs> He's about to tell me to submit this thing. And I opened it up. And you know when you open the phone and the cursor on the side, because the email's so long, it gets so small, you can't see it anymore? <laughs> well, that's what I had, right? And I was like, uh-oh. I mean, you wrote me. It had to be six or seven paragraphs. And you talked about two size discrepancies and gingival height discrepancies and, and value different. And I was like, I was just worried about the color. I mean, I think I nailed it. But I yeah. didn't never understood how well-trained an examiner's eye is to see stuff that I would have never even dreamed to look at. But at the bottom of your email, you wrote, P.S., 97% of dentists in this country would kill to do work like this. Keep it up. You're going to be fine. Yeah, and if you good. did not write that, I might have never done a case again. But it's true. I mean, I get people send me stuff, and I'm like, wow, that's really nice. You did some service. But remember, a minor and a minor plus a minor plus a minor is a fail right? Not that it's bad, but I mean, the stuff that I started to see, and like you said, there was a point where you would email me go, why are you sending me stuff? You know what you're doing. Because after 20 cases, 30 cases, 50 cases, and then forget it with fellowship, I must have sent you 100. You just, you start to see the things that, that's what I think the beauty of accreditation is, is how you evaluate yourself, your own work, and, and, the work you want to deliver to somebody is a whole nother world of what we thought was good before we ever even knew accreditation existed. I think sometimes the people I mentor get a little cranky with me too, because I kind of, I push them hard to tell me what they see. I want to know what you see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they see nothing, which means they got some work to do. And sometimes it's the other way around. They give me a list of 12 criteria and it's like, hold on. Ho, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you're you're killing yourself here. It's it's yes, okay. If you really want to, I, I understand you think that there's a um a zenith issue here, but it's it's certainly not significant enough that a that an examiner was ever going to note that um in your exam process. So it's sometimes, but again, it's training that eye and and balancing that to where and again, discernment's a big part of this. You know, we're here to mentor, we're not here, you know, we can teach a little bit as well, but you know, th this is this is working towards you seeing it. So you understanding what's going on there. And again, the idea of the five case types, you know, they're so well designed and each one of them has a, a particular thing that they're testing. 
And the value of, of getting all these criteria nailed in these cases is that gives you the beauty and the freedom to not do accreditation cases down the line that still are beautiful end results. Sure. You can have that, 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 that little you know, discrepancy. You can have that natural look. You know, everything has to be, you know, the thought that every case we have to do has to be accreditation is absurd. It just, it can't be done either from patient requests, either it, it's just, it's over treatment. Um, you know, there's just reasons why you would not do that, but you have to do it five times. You have to pick those cases that allow you to demonstrate that you understand those criteria. Now, moving that thought process, which again, I mean, with 12 camera views, and we're gonna talk a little bit about photography shortly, yeah. 12 views, um, a written report. I mean, there's a lot that goes into each, each of the five cases when you now, and, and I remember, I think I was right on the cusp of the change when, I mean, I remember my office manager and I bought me a new printer. We would buy the best paper because we used to print the reports with the photos right. in them and then put them on yeah. CDs and she would sweat all the way to the post office wondering to make sure the return receipt came. But now everything is, I mean, I saw the transformation as did you all completely to digital, right? So it's yeah. upload everything at your own pace. I mean, it's really, they've done such an amazing job with it to keep up with the technology and the time to make it easier for the candidate uh, and fairer. You know, we talked already about the anonymity, excuse me, of yeah. the exam, but even how you submit the exam now is different than what I did, way, obviously way different than slides. I mean, you didn't even see your photos till you got the slide roll back, right? So that had to be, now we can take 30 digital pictures and delete 29 of them. And Honestly, well, I'm going to get on the photography train right now because what drives me nuts is bad <laughs> photography because there's yeah. se seriously no, with digital cameras, there's no excuse, right? Yeah. There's absolutely no, you have the photo guide that shows you exactly that what the picture good. needs to look like. And yeah. remember, you're presenting yourself, right? I mean, when I talk about this to people I mentor or even in lectures, you imagine you send two sets of impressions to two different labs. And you say, our mount them on an articulator, set them back to me for study models. And one of them is sandpapered the way Hak Chu used to do them in so many of the labs we work with. Beautiful, clean. And then the other one, there's stone on the teeth. It's down the side of the articulator. You don't even have to know who it is. You're not going back, right? Yeah. Yep. So I think that's, to me, I equate that to the photography that comes in. I mean, if you're going to present who you are, and we start with beautiful textbook photography, you're already two steps ahead of the game. But there's no excuse for it because it's so easy to fix it now. I mean, would you agree 100%? Well, you know, again, we go back to the slide day. I take my shots, I pack them up, I get them out, I ship them, they come back in and 11 of them be good. And the 12th one stunk. And I, even though I took it three or four times, all four slides were no good. Patient back in, shoot it again, send it back out for development, get it back again. Yeah, so real hassle. Now, just what you're saying. I mean, it's instant feedback. Go right in, load them up, take a look at if, if you know if looking at them on your viewer is not good enough, that's fine. I get that. It doesn't take but a second to go load them up and pop them in the computer. That's how I train my staff, you know. And I make them take the book out, get the book out, set it there, and does it look just like the book? Because the photo guide is money. I mean, that's just, that's just, it, 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 follow it exactly. So I got a question for you. So we're on photography. Today, I, I don't shoot anything the way I've always shot. But, but now diffused lighting has become a, a, a big deal, a big thing, a very artistic thing. And while I can appreciate the artistry in that, I think we're seeing it both in accreditation and fellowship. We're struggling because we're losing information. What happens in the diffused lighting that creates that? situation where we lose this valuable information yeah I, that's a great question and, and obviously you know my uh, my love for social media and the artistic photography and the photo shoots i love i share them yeah. with you i mean i enjoy it i really do yes. um but you know with some of the lighting that people are using now um what it does in a positive manner to people's complexions and skin it does in a negative manner to teeth, right? So, you know, we talk about global aesthetics, macro aesthetics, micro aesthetics. When you get to micro aesthetics and you're looking for, wow, look at this candidate with composite. They put tertiary anatomy with pericomata and it's beautiful. And then you hit it with a soft box. Guess what? It makes it look like 
Uh, you took a photo of an 80 year old woman and their now skin looks like a 30 year old. It's smooth, which is great for a face, but it's terrible for teeth. You know, I have a dear friend of mine. He's probably even listening. He's a f probably one of the, in my opinion, the best dentist in the world, Carlos de Carvalho in Brazil. Yeah. And I heard, I literally out of his mouth and I quote it all the time. If you shoot before and afters with soft boxes, you're cheating because it hides everything. So that's the other thing I love. If you're passing cases, a cred or fellowship, and you're using a ring or a twin, God bless you. You're showing legit real dentistry because ring and twin flesh is a hard light. You can't yeah. hide anything in hard light. Yeah. You can hide them with a bouncer. You can hide them with a diffuser. You certainly can hide them with a soft box. Um, and we can't evaluate it. It only hurts you. So now, you know, we have the lighting protocol out where it's not allowed. I mean, there is no diffused lighting, no soft boxes allowed in, uh, in these cases. And it's for the candidate's benefit because we legit can't see what you did and you know, it'll hurt you. I mean, I'm, you know, we, we don't allow for, for headshots at this point for headshots. It's beautiful. It makes a, a facial complexion look outstanding, but for dentistry, diffuse lighting, there's a lot of photography that I see out there on social media where I know the dentistry is better than what I see because the photograph just doesn't look good with the lighting that they decided to use it. And, and it well, stinks. I think we've seen that. I mean, we've seen that in fellowship to where candidates are suffering from this because mm -hmm. they're putting in and it's like the buccal cord is gone, you know, it's just blacked out and the soft tissue. It's like, does that soft tissue really look like that? You know? Um, and, and so, and, and sometimes I look at those cases, I say, you know, I bet you that's a really good case but I can't see it and my examiners can't see it and they can't judge enough of the criteria. And so it turns into a, a failed case that otherwise would have been passed. So I think, you know, the lesson for anybody listening in, whether your accreditation road or your fellowship road is save your diffused lighting for whatever artistry you want to do, or you know, pictures in your office or your, your, you know, your social media posts or whatever you want to do with that. That's fine. Um, but make sure for the credential you're not shooting with those, with the, you know, with soft boxes or any kind of diffused lighting because it's a, it's a shame to put that in, put the hard work in and just get back a case that couldn't really even, at least if you fail a case, Adama, you get solid feedback. Oh, yeah. 100%. So if, you, if you put a case in and it doesn't pass, you get an education because the examiners will give you the criteria by which you didn't pass and, the, and, and list them in the order that they saw them. And, but, but if you get back that says, I'm sorry, we couldn't evaluate, you, you kind of wasted your learning opportunity. Yeah, and I'll, I'll even one up that, Brad. I mean, I'll tell you exactly what I do if I'm doing a case. I'll take one set with my, I use a twin flash, uh, a Canon twin flash 26 EX, and I'll take my photo series before and after with that. There are certain bounced lights that I love for post-op and pre-op smiles that I'm going to post on social media using my website. So I have another camera that just does that. Yep. Artistic shots with my soft boxes, but I can evaluate my dentistry. And for me, the before and after a good quality, simple ring or twin allows me to evaluate my work at the highest level. Cause if I can hide a class four margin with a twin or a ring flash and no diffuser, you're and good. I hit that thing real good, right? So yep. I only, I don't evaluate my dentistry based on my artistic photos because it's not fair. It's not proper. It, it, I, it hides stuff. I can get away with stuff. I keep it as raw as possible and use my twin flash. And if I can evaluate my dentistry there, like we did through fellowship and accreditation, I see my improvement. I see where I have to get better. Because if you nail it with a twin flash and then go take one with a diffuse, I mean, you look like, I mean, yeah, unbelievable, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think you're only doing yourself a disservice if you only shoot with the diffuse lighting. And I love them for the artsy stuff. I love them for the magazine covers. I love them for the internet. But if you're going against yourself, which is what I preach and you taught me to preach, you need to evaluate it with the hardest, simplest, rawest flash system there is. And it's ring or twin. And if you get good with that, any light you use after, you're going to look like a superstar, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. What in in your in your social media world, because you're you're connected to so many people in so many ways. What are you hearing uh, that are the obstacles? What's keeping people from taking the leap, diving in? Um, I would say, you know, 
a handful or a good handful would be where they are in their career in terms of their practice, right? So, you know, a lot of young, the younger people are associates. They can't afford to buy their own practice or, or, or practice on their own at this point and dictate their own systems. Um, so when you're under uh, working under somebody who may not have that vision, I think that's a huge obstacle. And, and, and I'll speak for my resident, Devin. Um, you know, she shadowed me for a year. And then she moved down to Virginia and worked in an office and she would message me every week how frustrated she was because she wanted to implement this system or do this composite. And it was a no because you're an associate and you don't have the material. And maybe you don't get to see all those cases because they're hiding them from you and they're taking those bigger production cases. So I, I think for a lot of the younger crowd that I, I mentor, um, that's a huge obstacle. I mean, yeah. I only know one person uh, who's a good friend of mine who was an associate in office and, and she gets what she wants. And she was like, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I want to do accreditation and you're going to give me what I want. And she did, but not every associate's getting that answer. No, right? I we're getting a, yeah. Okay. Go down the road and practice somewhere else. So it's uh, I think that's a big obstacle. Um, yeah. I, I would probably say that that's the number one. Um, I haven't really heard much about, you know, every once in a while you'll hear the, well, what, you know, what's the point? Who cares? What does it do for you? It doesn't make you a specialist. It doesn't make you that. Well, you know what? I don't disagree, but I will tell you what I paid for, as you have a ton of CE in, a, in our careers and you more than I have. Yeah. What I learned from you as my mentor, I, I, it, it's completely priceless. I, there's no way I could have added that all up because it, it was in cosmetic. I never would have seen. There's no class I ever went to where they explained the things the way you did to me as as a mentor in terms of evaluating cases and all every little detail about things that all examiners and, and accredited members now understand, right? Because we're exposed to it. When you haven't been, it's a it's a I, such an eye opening experience. It's frightening. I mean, I, I that's why I push everybody. I say, listen, you think you're good and you have a good eye now. Go grab a, a an examiner or a really or an accredited member who's been through this and let them evaluate a case and they'll you're gonna list three things they're gonna list thirty three and you're gonna be like wait what the hell just happened, um, yeah. and, and I think that's a huge thing. So to to go back to your question, um, I think that has a lot to do with. It. I mean these the younger crews coming out with a lot of debt and and yeah. and being an associate and and I get it you got to pay your bills, but you know I I always look up to uh, Amanda, when, when we talk about this, you know, I, I was blessed when I came out as an associate, I, I worked in a fee for service practice from the start. I got lucky. Um, I, but I rode with it, right? I went with it. Amanda didn't, right? She used to, she'll tell you the story. She used to drive two hours to shadow Tom Trinkner, who's a phenomenal dentist, as you know. Yeah. And yeah. she then realized how she wanted to practice and pregnant, married with nothing, opening from scratch and takes a loan out to do CE. I mean, that's vision. That's, yeah. that's what you need to do. So if you want to, if you see somebody you want to practice like, or, or somebody that you is a role model to you, you got to take the plunge a little bit and it can't be about the finance. You got to just go do it because you will make it back. I mean, she says it, you say yeah. it, I say it. I mean, every penny I've ever spent on anything, I definitely made back tenfold without question. Um, and the education is invaluable. Well, you know, the other thing you're touching on here is, you know, we're, we're dropping names here and, and, and rightly so is the other thing about this academy is how approachable the people are in the academy. If you want help, they're there, there's somebody and you can get different opinions and how we go there. I remember, you know, I've, I've sat there with Brian Valleyboss before and he just like, he's just picking my brain. He's just going at it, you know, and he's just, you know, taking whatever, nugget he can get from that and then he'll turn to brian and he'll pick his brain and then you know you go through it enough and you know even to this day i you know it's kind of nice that i got uh, betsy bakeman michael sesman and brian lesage on speed dial you know i mean talk about yeah having a not a bad asset right at your <laughs> fingertips you know yeah. i mean but but that would be that's my generation but then there'll be the your generation so having you and amanda um you know i have a couple young dentists who i think highly of and I asked both of you and you agreed, you know, if they reach out, will you, you know, 
absolutely happy to help them answer any questions they want to have. So going back to your dentists who are, you know, in those associate positions, the only thing I could maybe suggest off the top of my head is, you know, a, a camera I get is expensive, but that's one of the best investments you'll ever make in terms of understanding what you're looking at, getting good at photographer, photography, assessing your own work. Um, and so starting with that camera and just, there's, you know, there's no reason you can't shoot as many shots as you want on a patient. I know time is probably limited because you, you're on a production line and you got to keep it rocking, but just taking a few minutes to get in with that camera and shoot and use that. And then maybe just hand pick a case here or there that you stay late one night, you know, and you get the boss's permission that, Hey, I really want to work on this class four and I'll stay late. And it's, you know, I'm off the clock and it's not on my production, but I just really want to do this. Maybe there's just little, little avenues. Again, I didn't go that road, so it's unfair for me to say that, but I'm just trying to think of ways that younger dentists and people who are in different situations can still find a way to grow um, and not be under the thumb of these, you know, maybe a corporate situation doesn't allow them much flexibility. Yeah. And you know, it's funny you say that when I started accreditation, I was an associate and I treated, I think four out of my five cases were family. And one of them was a, a, a real good friend. Um, and I did them after hours and I did them Sunday morning. I didn't yeah. care. I, I, I wanted it that bad. And it not only opened my boss at the time's eyes up. I mean, he knew about it, but he didn't go, you know, he didn't do it. But my staff was like, Whoa, what is this? And then they would see the outcome and be like, wow. And, and it's so motivating to everyone around you. And, and even my patients who were family and friends were so excited. Right. And, and I think when you have that kind of fire for something, no matter who you work for, they're going the fire is going to hit them somehow. They're going to be like, this, this yeah. is not right. This is not a, an ordinary associate. I mean, this person's doing after hours work to get better or practicing uh, on models to learn composites. I mean, it's a different, it goes back to the clean models thing, right? I send you yeah. a 30 set of mounted models versus a clean. Or if I have three associates in that office and one of them is staying after hours to get better, I'm going to look at that associate a little different. I'm going to give them a little more leeway. Do what you want. I mean, it, the, the word's going to spread, community is going to know, and it's in the end going to help the owner. So, I mean, don't be afraid of it. I, I would say go for it. And you're right. I would do it after hours. I mean, I did it after hours. I, I did whatever I had to do to, to, yeah. to get it. So, I think that's great advice, to be completely honest. Well, and I'm wondering how many practices right now, I know certainly not mine, how many are back to 100%, 100% full speed? I mean, I, I can't imagine a lot. I'm sure some are. That's great. But mine is not. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is a little window that you can use to put some time in the lab with, a, you know, print out a few models and mess with the composite and do some preps on them and photograph them and take impressions of them and, you know, just just spend a little time there or spend extra time on a patient you normally would not have, but sure. the schedule is soft enough that it allows you to put that extra time in maybe. So I don't know, just trying to think out loud for people who are, you know, where they're, where they're meeting some obstacles in, in moving forward. Yeah. It's funny. Cause one of the questions I get a lot message to me is what are you going to do about your camera now that with COVID and everything, I'm, like, I'm going to put it on the table. I'm going to take all the damn pictures I want. And I'm going to wipe it when I'm done. The camera's never leaving my side. I mean, you, you're right. I cannot practice without a digital camera. It's yeah. a physical impossibility for me to yeah. do quality dentistry for your patient, not for social media, not for artistic posts. You cannot deliver good dentistry without a camera. I, there's, and I know you agree with me. We've talked about this plenty of times. I don't know how anybody could possibly do a consultation for high end restorative or cosmetic dentistry without images. Yeah. You know, I mean, both images of the patient you're working with and then maybe some other images to give them an idea of where it could go. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how you would possibly present that kind of treatment plan um, just by, you know, verbal uh, calisthenics and just telling them, hey, these are the great things I'm going to do for you. Take my word. It's going to be great. Yeah. So one thing I, I wrote a couple questions down for us, and, and I'm curious to hear this for, from you, um, because I know, you know, I, I'm not in the academy nearly as long. Like I said, I, I remember my first meeting saying, man, I hope I do work half this good, you know, and then I got on the board and, and then I was asked to be an examiner and now I'm the 
accreditation chair, which when I first got accredited, I was like, man, one day I'd love, love, that's like my dream job to be the accredited chair. Um, you've sat in now both chairs. Um, so what's been the most valuable thing to you? I know how much the credential means to you. I know how much the academy means to you, but what's so special about that position? You've, you've served both. I'm on, I don't know what year of my a credit chair term, but I, I know deep down what it means to me. It means everything. So I'm curious to hear from you being in both positions. And, and I just want to know from the heart what that means to you. What, what, what do both chair positions mean to you? And is there any difference? Yeah. You know what? One of the things, um, my, my twins were three months old when I received my accreditation um, in Nashville. So Sharon couldn't be there. By the way, your kids said hi on Instagram. I just want to let you know. So <laughs> they always keep me up to date on what you're up to. <laughs> Dr. Adamo is the most unique man we've ever met. <laughs> but that's that, unique. That's one word for it. That's totally a great word. Thank you for being so kind. <laughs> most Kathy interesting. And Connor, I appreciate you too. What was the commercial? The most interesting man in the world. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I remember that flash. I remember the flash of being there for my fellowship. But what you remember the most are the people you mentor and who you help guide and you get to stand there and watch them celebrate and you get to, you get to watch them celebrate with their family and their friends and be part of that. Those memories are actually stronger um, than, than my, my quick flash, my quick moment in, and you know, that kind of just passed by and was there and gone. But every year, we get to celebrate. We get to, you know, stand up and, and just just watch the joy and, and the happiness and the tears and the and the and the families and the staff and the whole thing. And I, you know, that the the, the feeling you get from that is is you know, that it's just nothing better. Um, you know, when somebody comes up and says, I took my workshop, I took your workshop, I became motivated, I was so excited, I've passed four cases, you know that's huge. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's a, that's a big deal. That makes you feel, you know, and, and again, you say, Oh, well, I did it for them. Yeah. But if you're honest, you do it for yourself because it feels damn good. You know, it feels, it, it gives you that, that, you know, a sense of accomplishment. Um, and you know, you see people that I see people far surpass, you know, you've heard me say it before. It's like, sometimes I feel kind of like David Ledbetter, um, where, you know, I got, a, I've got a good eye and I can, teach you stuff and show you stuff, but you're the, you're the pro, you're the touring pro. I can't beat you on the golf course, but I can teach you a lot of things. I can help guide you. I can help pick out things for you and be in that person in the backdrop that helps, you know, move them along. And then boy, you see the work and you see how they grow and see where they move to, you know, and I think of, uh, you know, people like yourself and Amanda and, and, um, you know, just, just, different folks I've, I've seen, you know, Scott Finley and just I, the names go on. I could drop names all, all evening here of people who just, they just take off and they soar in their careers. And you look back and you're like, just being a little part of that somewhere along the line is, is hugely rewarding. So I'd say that probably is why, you, you know, you're, you're willing to put your time in and, and give what you give to the process. Yeah. I mean, I, that's funny you say that. Unfortunately, you know, with the cancellation of the, of the meeting this year, um, you know, we will celebrate next year, uh, yeah. but I think we have 10 accredited this year, and I, I'm pretty sure, I know for a fact, four solid I mentored, maybe yeah. five, and I'm like, wow, you know, like, I, I helped a little bit, but you did it, you know, and, and you're right, it's cool to see them, and I guess, you know, what you, you had said to me, from my first case I submitted to you to my 60th case, it's a whole different dentist, and, and I mean... I think for me, the case I love to see the most, and, and I'm wondering if you're going to agree with me, is case type five, right? Because it's the yeah. most challenging. Six yeah. direct resin veneers is no joke. Yeah. Um, and when they send you the first round, and if they stick with your guidance, the way I, I remember, I thought my first one was good, and my email was this long from you. I didn't disagree at all. And the week, week after, I went back at it, and then the email was this much bigger, and then it shrunk and it shrunk. I learned so much between smile design and how to handle composite that case from, from your guidance, yeah. but to see them from 
the first look to like, let's say sometimes the fifth. I'm me, it was 11. It took 11 appointments for me to finish that. Yeah. And, you know, again, that's not everyday practice. This is accreditation level. Um, but you would think if I showed you round one versus round 11, you could say there's no way the same person did it. He cheated. But the growth <laughs> that you get from that one case alone to me is the coolest one to see. And it's obviously the hardest. It's usually the last one, right, yeah. that people submit. But to see the growth and the, the satisfaction when they pass that one, not that every other one isn't difficult, don't get me wrong, but there's just something about that one that really makes it special because I think you see the biggest growth in their technical skills, in their photography, and in their discussion to you on what mm -hmm. they now see from the beginning. I mean, would you agree with me in terms of the case types? You know, it's 100%. And, and again, you know, we, we harp on this so much, but case selection is everything. I never forget doing an oral exam and, and having a candidate at the end of the exam. We're pretty straightforward in our oral exam. You know, it's, it's, it's psychometrically evaluated and it's very strict on how we go through our steps and what we do. But at the end, we do have the ability to have a little conversation just to, you know, tell us a little input. Sure. And I'll never forget one candidate saying to me, the case that we talked about, we just finished talking about my case type five. I had, I did case type five on my wife and we did, I must have worked on that for a zillion hours and showed it my mentor 10 times and I submitted it twice and it failed every time. He says, we almost got divorced over it. <laughs> it, got, it got so bad. And he said, but so much of what I learned, and he says, then I realized that I picked a much better case and not only, not only were my skill set so much stronger, but I picked a better case, a much more straightforward case, and here I am. You know, so getting out of your mind that this case has to pass, sometimes you have to step away from a case. You just have to walk away and say, I've learned a lot from that. They've got a nice smile. They're upgraded. That patient's been upgraded from oh, where yeah. they were. But sometimes you have to step away and come in and go at it fresh. And, um, and, and again, yeah, and the beauty of case type five is getting the right candidate to let you rework it and letting you go in because you can cut back you can go in and reshape mm -hmm. it's sometimes tougher if it's you know not a family member or friends it's kind of tougher when when a, somebody looks at the case type three and says doc i don't know what you're talking about this looks great to me i'm not coming back four more times <laughs> i'm done this is great this is all i could ask for yeah and there's nothing wrong with that no. there's really nothing wrong with that at all i mean you know i it's funny when I talk about my journey and, and how I did it, my office manager laughs at me and she's like, yeah, you did it in a year. And I'm like, I did, but I didn't just do five cases. I didn't, I mean, I sent Brad 50 cases in a year yeah. and the difference between me and, and it's okay to submit them if your mentor says it's borderline because you're going to, like you said, the feedback you get from exams, if you fail is awesome. You yeah. can review it with your mentor, but I, any case that you ever said, eh, maybe, I said goodbye. So yeah. there's a reason that I went five for five. It's because I actually listened to you. Yeah. And some of the, the challenges I find is, as, and I tell them, because I, I basically mentor the way you mentored me, exactly. And I'll write at the bottom of the email, hey, you did a great service. It's borderline, I'm not sure if you want to submit it. I don't know if it's going to pass or fail, but if it fails, you're going to get great feedback. It's borderline. It's up to you. And some people do that. And then other people are like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm submitting it anyway. And then it comes back and they're like, you know what? You were right. I didn't pass that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I get that. And it's okay to fail, but you don't take, I think a lot of the, some of the people I've mentored take that failure as it's impossible and it's not impossible at all. It's right. definitely not impossible. Just f listen. Like I always like to say, read directions follow good guidance. And a lot of it is case selections. I mean, I had a guy, a mentor, and I'm talking about mad skills. When he sent me his case type five, it was a full mouth rehab in composite. And I was like, are you nuts? Like, you're really like great. Yeah. He passed it. It was insane. But like, you don't want to do that. I mean, that talk about case selection, that's gets a little, a little crazy, but you know, uh, mentors are here to guide us and educate us. And a lot of people have this false sense of we made the credentials so hard that it's impossible. And I think that's the farthest thing from the truth. Cause I think anybody who works hard, or I shouldn't say anybody, 
a, a majority of people, if they put the time, effort, and they work and listen to their mentor, they can do it. Yeah. They might not do it in, in five for five. They might take five years. They might have to go for an extension. But the, I think that journey, as long or short as it is, is an invaluable experience. Absolutely. No, and you know, we, we harp on that. We just talk about the journey and the growth and where you go with it and what you learn as you go. You know, I mean, um, and again, I've had, I've had candidates just, you know, I, I basically outlined to them and I, I don't, I never tell a candidate pass or fail. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're working with your mentor and you're saying, please tell me whether I should submit this or not, whether it'll pass or fail, you're, you're, you're working the wrong way. That's, that's not how a mentor is supposed to work with you. But I write in there is just, you know, this as I write in there, here are the things the examiners may note. And I don't necessarily tell them this is a minus four, this is a minus two, this is minus. I just give them criteria for them to look at and see what's there. And some of the criteria, quite frankly, I might not, if it was my personal scorecard, I'd probably take nothing off. But I still notice it enough to say, this is a criteria that may be noted. Don't be surprised if you see that, if your case doesn't pass. So discernment is huge. I mean, it's, that's, the, that's the growth process, the learning process. We're not there you know, to, to, to tell you what to submit and to tell you whether to submit it. I've had candidates say, you know, I'd like you to be on call on Friday morning so I can send you some photos of the try and tell me whether to submit it or not. But no. Yeah. That's, that's not the way the system works. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, uh, you've been in, the, in this game a little bit longer than I have. And now that the numbers have increased, I mean, I have some that do that and I answer the same way you would have answered me. Um, because, and if that offends them, I apologize, but this is a learning experience. Again, yeah. the, the, the ultimate goal is to become accredited, but you, the importance of it is the education and the journey along with it. And I think anybody who's succeeded will say that. And let's talk about value. Let's be honest. Is it, is, what's more valuable to go to a weekend course and get a certificate and saying you're now a fellow or you're accredited or you're a diplomat or whatever it is, or going through a process where you take a written exam, you present five cases, you pass those cases, you defend them in an oral exam. Tell me where the value is. Tell me, tell me what, you know, you, you'll, you'll look back and you'll say, I earned that. That's something that I can, that I hang that up and I, I have that as an achievement in my career because it wasn't just straightforward. It wasn't simple. I mean, there are the, there are the rare few out there who probably just, you know, took five cases, knocked them out, turned them in, have a nice day. I can think of a couple of candidates in our career that, um, you know, they just, it just comes so naturally for them. It comes so easy. And they, there were so, cases were so plentiful that they were in that position, but they're few and far between. The rest of us, we had to grind for it. Yeah. You know, and, and we've talked a lot about the credential and, and the written exam and I remember when the year I got accredited, I was in your fellowship workshop right away because I was ready to go. So for those on the social media platform listening now who don't know what the fellowship process entails, can you explain a little bit? Yeah. So, um, you know, I try when we do accreditation workshops, as you well know, we try not to spend very much time on fellowship because you need to you need to get this under your belt first, because fellowship is presenting 50 cases if you're a dentist. If you're a laboratory technician, 30 cases. You know, we really haven't touched on laboratory technicians and we need to do that before we sign off here because, I mean, let's be honest. You know, we get, we get the glory many times and the glory comes from oh. their incredible artistry. I mean, you know, we, 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 sometimes, you know, it's just, I feel like I'm the cut and paste guy um, and the real artistry. But, you know, and again, for the dentist, your artistry comes in four and five because you have to, you know, that you have to do with your own hands. Um, and not to say that there isn't artistry in, involved in the other parts of that, but our ceramists are, are everything. I mean, if we don't have them, we're nothing. So um, I would really love to see a way to get them pumped up more and get them more excited in the process. But back to fellowship, get back on the, on the topic. 50 cases, um, the criteria, I mean, the uh, protocol is there. So it's a combination. So what you're really presenting in fellowship is a body of work. You're showing that I'm taking on these very different styles of cases that are still following the protocol. Now, it's only two shots, so you're taking a smile and an attractive. So you're not taking 12 shots on every one of these cases, mm -hmm. but you're taking two shots, smile, straight on, retracted, straight on, and um, that's what you're presenting. And you're presenting 50 of them, and again, it's a body of work. How does everything tie together? 
So anybody who's interested in that process, first of all, please reach out to me. I've had just here recently, um, had a candidate just say, hey, I don't want to bug you, but I got some questions. It's not bugging me. Questions are fine. I can't mentor because I'm the chair. So I have to, I, I look different than accreditation. You can mentor as accreditation chair because every case is anonymous, you're not in there. But in fellowship, I evaluate every single submission. So I go through every submission. So I can't see your work because I, I, I don't have to recuse myself from my job. Yeah. Um, so from that standpoint, but, but working with a mentor there is important. But, but again, it's, it's a body of work, how it all ties together, how you're showing, you know, how you took it, the different groups of cases, case type one, two, three. And there's more flexibility in fellowship too. We won't get into the details of it, but, and take the workshop, please, in Denver. Please, if you're accredited, please come to the workshop in Denver because we spend, you know, we spend a whole morning or afternoon um, going through the protocol, but then we just look at case after case after case after case to kind of get a feel for what people are presenting and what examiners are looking for. Yeah, I mean, going through both processes, uh, and, and we, I'm only fellowed for less than two years now. Um, I remember when I got a credit and I came to the workshop and I printed a piece of paper numbered one to 50 and it was duct taped to my desk at my office and I filled yeah. that in ready to go. And as it started to get full, you know, you get a little excited, but the, the cool thing is, is going through that is, is you really looked at every case as, Hey, does this have potential? And I photographed everything. Yeah. I evaluated everything. I probably evaluated 150 cases and picked 50, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's where the education comes in and you evaluating in the rawest of format, ring or twin flash, nothing fancy, befores and afters of all your work. Um, for that, it took me six years pretty much. Sure. And it's, that's a lot of dentistry to critique yourself on and, and, and have a mentor such as yourself or, or the other phenomenal fellowship mentors that are out there. Um, really educate you and guide you on. I mean, it's just, it's outstanding. It really is outstanding. Well, I would really love to see that, you know, if you're a candidate for fellowship, work with, you know, get your technician involved. If they're not accredited, get them, get them in that road. Um, if they are accredited, get them on the fellow road with you. Um, if you're going through accreditation, find a laboratory technician that's interested or motivated and you guys do it together. You can submit the same case. The yeah. same case can you know, it's not like they have to be separate cases. There's little different requirements for each, but I, I really want to see our technicians, you know, give, there was kind of a window where they were very engaged. I feel like that's backed off a little bit. And I'd like yeah. to see that. I'd like to see that jump started again in some, some fashion. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you and I both agree. I mean, we worked with the same ceramist for a long, long time and man, did she make us look good. I tried so hard to get her to do accreditation and her answer was the same every time. Adamo, my English not so good. I can't pass written exam. Like, you're gonna pass the rest. Just do something, because your work is just oh. But between deep. you and me and Gary and and, oh. and George and how many people we had and, and Larry and you know the list goes on. It's like, uh, Hachu, you you've got 150 cases. We can easy. We got you covered on the cases. But she used to tell me the same thing. Yeah. It was just that you know she just the, the written exam was just too intimidating for her. So. But. Yeah, so um, I'm down to about a minute 45 left. So we've pretty much done an hour on the count on, on Instagram. Um, I don't know if you have uh, anything else you want to discuss. I think we've covered a pretty good amount. Me too. Uh, it was, Thank uh, you for the invite. It was I've, a, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. It's very rare we get you on social media. So this is, <laughs> man, this is a big surprise to everyone. I know your kids are definitely watching because this uh, might be the last time. Can you on your phone or do you have to have a computer? <laughs> or are you using Connor's phone right now to do this? Exactly. Because there's no yeah. way it's on you. They won't let me touch their electronics. Yeah, get away from it. Nothing good's going to happen if you get hold of it. So. I love it. I love it. Well, Brett, thank you for your time tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody who tuned in. Um, this will be on my Facebook feed for good. And um, the, a copy of this will go to the Academy. So it'll go on uh, the website and their virtual campus. And um, any questions, you can email myself or Brad. If you don't have Brad's email because it's not all over social media, email me. I'll gladly give it to you and redirect. It's pretty it simple. It's brad at smileimages.com. Brad at smileimages.com. Just shoot me whatever you want to shoot me. Awesome. Happy to look. Have a good night, my friend. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Be well. Thank you.